This is the Seminole Wars Authority. Hello and welcome. The sands of time, nature, and settlement have ravaged the terrain where soldiers and Seminole battled each other in Florida in the 1800s. In South Florida, of course, this is true, but with a twist. In some cases, modern buildings have been constructed atop archaeological sites that had not been previously excavated. That provides the opportunity for investigation in the future. For decades, Bob Carr has been digging Miami, the title of his recently released book, and navigating around such obstacles. He's also worked extensively outside of Miami in the South Florida region, at the Big Cypress Reservation and at the Okeechobee Battlefield. He joins us to discuss how he has teased out the truth from the South Florida soil about the Seminole Wars, what he's found, and why it's important. Bob Carr, welcome to the Seminole Wars Authority. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Bob, you're both an anthropologist and an archaeologist. What's the difference between the two and what you do? Anthropology is the study of culture, the study of man, as they say in a classic sense. And uh, anthropology means you can be looking at ethnography, which is studying living cultures and archaeology. Generally speaking, you're studying past cultures, and the way you do that is by looking at the material culture, that is, the artifacts and the materials that were directly affected by humans and preserved in one form or another. What's the difference between the two, and why are they often combined? Well, I think you can't lose sight as an archaeologist to the greater ideas and questions about human behavior, human culture, and archaeology essentially is one way of looking at one aspect of human culture. So if you're interested in the Seminole Wars, then you have to have a good context, not only of the historical narrative, but of the origins of Native people and the things that were part of their culture that would have been a part of understanding what the conflict was all about. So it's not just a historical accuracy. It is a anthropological study in terms of understanding what culture and what people are responding to and what their idea of what their importance of their world is all about and where the boundaries of their world might be in terms of their sense of geography, which is so different in, in historical times than ours. So, for example, understanding that it's we Westerners that have this idea of ownership of land, of titles and surveys, as opposed to indigenous people who see land as this kind of continual open space, although not without boundaries, but they are boundaries that might be noted as a, a particular river separating one tribal group from another. So this whole different concept of geography is intrinsic to their anthropology and thus gives you some insight as to the origin of some elements of the, of the conflict between these two worlds, the Western way of thinking and the indigenous sense of what their world is like. Before we go further, Bob, where do you hang your hat? Currently, I am the director for the not-for-profit Archaeological and Historical Conservancy. We're based in Davie, just outside of Fort Lauderdale. And we're very active. We're doing projects all over Florida. Uh, we're looking at uh, all kinds of questions of anthropology and archaeology in terms of sites with our main mission trying to augment the preservation of uh, most significant sites in Florida, but at the same time documenting sites. Okay. Tell us more about your book, Digging Miami. Well, Digging Miami is a compilation and summary of the archaeological discoveries that have come out of the work that's been done in Miami, beginning with the first active county program in the United States, where the county uh, actually started a archaeological survey of the entire county, that is, the, of the non-Everglades portion of the county. And I was the archaeologist that was hired to implement that program. It was a two-year survey of looking at all these different sites. And that led to a position as becoming the first county archaeologist, I believe, in, in the United States, and certainly one of the first county archaeologists. That position also led to the creation of the first county ordinance fully implemented in the United States that protected archaeological sites in Dade County and eventually in the city of Miami proper. The importance of that work was germane to the book in the sense that with all of the experience in terms of seeing so many sites, 
and dealing with so many sites being destroyed, I was able to really observe a tremendous amount of information that was not in the public record in an easy, accessible way. So I gave myself that mission to try to compile that, not just in these scientific articles that we write as part of our archaeological reports, but to create a book that would be available to students, to interested people, in a way that summarizes history, to, in part, to dismiss the mythology that was created with the city of Miami's founding in 1896, this idea that Miami is this modern city, this modern place, and that essentially the people didn't even live there before the arrival of Europeans, in some cases Seminoles, depending on who you might have been talking to. So my idea was, let's make sure that people really understand the longevity of human heritage in Miami, and let's do that through the archaeological evidence that has been uncovered over the years, going back, frankly, to 11,000 years before present. What part did the Seminoles play in this period? The Seminoles were a critical part, and anybody who's interested in seeing the book will discover that there are chapters directly discussing and uncovering the evidence of the Seminole times that were in Dade County, specifically in Miami. It included the first settlements of Seminoles that would have come down in the early 19th century, although admittedly there probably were pre Seminole groups coming down earlier on hunting trips, certainly on slave raids going back to 1709. We know that the uh, Yamasee were coming down and other tribes from uh, Georgia and South Carolina on these major slave raids that were instigated by the English planters who were looking for slaves for their rice and indigo plantations. And so that was a part of the history that is told in this book through the various artifacts that have been found. And then it goes right up to the Seminole occupation of the Everglades after the Seminole Wars. That was the main area of occupation was on the rim or the edge of the Everglades, as well as the Tree Island, and encountering, particularly after the Civil War, creating a new relationship with Anglo-Americans to trade various trading posts on southeast Florida particularly the Brickell Trading Post at the mouth of the Miami River. And that's part of the story in that in this book as well. Of course, uh, the Second Seminole War and Third Seminole War in particular are highly featured in the book, talking about the various forts and depots that were located in Dade County and some of that history, including research that was done at the National Archives, with a lot of help from Bill Steele, a Seminole War historian, who played a major role in some of those early years of documenting sites in Dade County. You mentioned the Seminole. Who were the Seminole? It's always of interest to scholars to know the origin of of anything and anyone in terms of any group. It's a fascinating history in terms of the word Seminole, which there is a Spanish word, Cimarrone, which some people believe was part of the derivative for Seminole, although there are other accounts indicating that Seminole was a, a name used in the 18th century for certain groups and tribes. But Cimarroni is one theory that attributed to indigenous people that were refugees from Georgia coming down, living outside of St. Augustine. When the British took over Florida in 1767, I believe, They inherited, of course, the responsibilities of trade and networking with the native tribes in northern Florida in particular. It seems as if Cimarroni might have become Seminole by simply an anglicized spelling. And so eventually the Seminoles made themselves the Seminoles because it just became this popular usage. So understanding that the Seminoles have many origins with many different groups and tribes through the years as a result of the migrations into Florida, as a result of contact with remnant tribes, including probably the Kest and Calusa, whichever people might have been left in the Everglades. This is true with all people. We can talk about European countries, and if you think about Germany, for example, you realize uh, Germany was a a nation relatively recently, and it was a confederation of of different states. If you go back early enough, all of these European countries had origins from different waves of migrants from different parts of Europe and Asia, and in some cases, North Africa. We've always been an amalgam of different people, and understanding that is an important aspect dealing with humans and dealing with culture, understanding that we are the same everywhere and yet different, and we all have these origins that are hardly monocultural, that it's always been 
on this phenomena of the merging of groups in assimilation. One of the posts that the Army put up to remove those Seminoles from Florida was called Fort Dallas. Well, Fort Dallas certainly was a focal point for American military presence in southeast Florida. There's no open invitation for uh, Seminoles to be coming in unless they were going to be uh, taken to Oklahoma. Some of them were taken as a result of military raids. Some of them probably did surrender. With the end of the war and the end of the need for those posts, approximately when did Seminole come out of the Everglades and start trading again, in peace with Americans? The trading practices began after the Second Seminole War, but more likely after the Third Seminole War, and there were individuals trading, but the trading post most people are familiar with in southeast Florida and Miami is the Brickell trading post on the south bank of the Miami River. William Brickell originally came from Ohio and became very successful in gold prospecting, first in California, then in Australia, but not through the gold that he uncovered, but rather the gold that he got in trade for merchandise. He became a merchant, a store focusing on these miners. Eventually, he found his way in South Florida, he migrated directly from Australia with his British wife. And they set up a home and store at the south bank of the river, began trading with the Seminoles who would come in with alligator skins and deer skin, and they would end up getting credit in some cases and then eventually get paid in silver quarters, was apparently one of the favorite ways that they would receive their monies. And these quarters were and coins in general were favored by the Seminoles because they were used as ornaments as part of the dress on women. William Brickell established a trading post in 1871. It was active right up to the early 1900s, probably about circa 1908 is when William Brickell died, and it may be that much of that practice fell off. There were other stores that picked it up. There was the Gertman store in downtown Miami that was part of the trade networking going on in the early 20th century. The William Brickell store was, was particularly interesting because it was uh, a, a focal point of trade. And William Brickell invested in a tremendous amount of glass beads that he bought by way of merchants. Most of the beads were made in Europe. And he had them stored in his basement of the house, the cellar, which is unusual in Miami to have a cellar. But since he's from Ohio, northerners brought this idea of brood cellars and storage places under the house. So they just cut into the bedrock and created a cellar that was filled with wooden barrels, filled with beads and bins. The reason I know about that is because when the last Brickle heir who lived in the Brickle house died in 1961, I believe, all of those beads were still in the cellar, many of them that had not been sold or traded. The local collectors picked up a lot of those beads. I, as a young man growing up in Miami, as a teenager, got to see what was left of the beads that hadn't already been scavenged. And that collection became the part of the nucleus of a article I wrote. That was about the seminal trade with the Brickles. Interestingly enough, the Brickles also had an affiliation with the Stranahan trading posts on the New River in Fort Lauderdale. And it's obvious from having the opportunity to have done an archaeological dig at the Stranahan house that there was the same beads were there as at the Brickle trading post indicating that Brickell was actually supplying Stranahan with the beads. He actually provided them the land, so he had a very good relation with the Stranahans. And so this trade network was very successful, and not only providing an opportunity for commerce for the Seminoles, but a route for assimilation and acceptance into the pioneer white communities where they were encouraged to be educated, particularly like uh, Ivy Stranahan and Mary Brickle. As you know, it's often the, the women in the families that make the difference with education and was reaching out in a very humanistic way. So the Brickles and the Stranahans created very good relations with the Seminoles, and the Ivy Stranahan in particular led the way for helping to create a, a state reservation for the Seminoles. These connections that they made to white traders became very important eventually for the politics of their survival, which had to become politicized at some point, and it had to be legitimized through these reservations that were provided to the tribes because the white settlement was so extensive and threatened uh, just about any and every place, particularly near the coast, that Seminoles and Miccosukees were trying to survive that. It became a critical part of their adaptation and their success in Florida after the Seminole Wars.
What evidence for seminal presence have you found? Well, that's a great question. And part of our archaeological explorations along the Miami River, we have found, frankly, no evidence that we've seen that the Seminoles were living at the mouth of the river where most of these settlements were. So it seems as if there was always a European, a white presence, we know in Miami, intermittently going back to the 16th century. But there were Seminole camps along the Miami River. Eventually, they became tourist attractions like Nisa Isle and Pirate's Cove. They were using locations to some degree that might have been earlier camps from the 19th century. The Seminoles became very, very familiar with the Miami River, and they were traversing the river on a weekly basis to go to the trading post, and they were a common sight to see in downtown Miami, the Seminoles walking in line in traditional clothing right up to the 1920s and 30s, and actually even more recent to the 1940s. But in the earlier 20th century period, they had a very prominent presence throughout South Florida in these urban areas. When we read about South Florida in John T. Sprague's The Florida War, he mentions Spanish Seminoles. Who were these Spanish Seminoles? Well, that was one of the more interesting discoveries in my years of research. Who were the Spanish Indians? Were they simply just Spanish-speaking Seminoles and Miccosukees, or were they somebody different? What I discovered, based on the research I've done, is that the Spanish Indians, the so-called Spanish Indians, were likely remnants of the Clusa and Duquesta, who knew Spanish because there had been an extensive network of travel between South Florida and Cuba between 1709 right up to the early 1800s as a result, partially because the English sponsored Yamasi raids going into South Florida forced uh, the remnant Calusa and Tecasta and other Indians fleeing from Appalachia all were gathered in the Key West area. And they petitioned the governor of Cuba to essentially rescue them. And the governor sent ships in 1709, and these immigrations of refugees left South Florida from 1709 to 1763 in different groupings, and several thousand of the Indians eventually made their way to Cuba, of the remnant Indians. But many of them came back. Not surprisingly, they spoke Spanish. They had developed relations with the Spanish, where they were bringing feathers from parakeets. They were bringing dried fish. So it was an extensive trade going on. In exchange, they were getting the supplies they needed, but they were also picking up ammunition and guns because, of course, they need that as hunters. That's, that's what everybody basically had a gun. There's nothing unusual about that. But when the United States, through the Treaty of Moultrie, decided that Indians were going west, Spanish Indians reportedly initially, who were actually enemies of the Seminole because of these raids, they saw that some of the ancestors of the, uh, the Seminoles actually were some of the people involved in these raids, that they thought they were exempt from this uh, forced migration. And these were the so-called Spanish fishermen or rancheros that were mostly in southwest Florida. And, and they quickly found out that the U.S. government was not distinguishing between them and the Seminoles. And so they soon and quickly joined the fight against the U.S. government. It was the Spanish Indians who led the infamous raid on the Cape Florida Lighthouse. It was the Spanish Indians who attacked Henry Perrine. These were not Seminoles. These were people who were familiar with the Keys and, as I said, part of these remnant Pelusin de Casta people. So calling them Southern Seminole is more of a convenience. That's right. You hit it right on the nose. Whereas the Spanish and the English, and during their time of uh, ruling Florida, uh, went to great pains, frankly, to distinguish tribes and villages and towns as to ethnicity, as to group, as to... The Americans who came in, you know, remember, it was a military occupation, essentially, in the beginning to the wars. They weren't distinguishing. They, they weren't interested in the anthropology of these people. They were interested in the extinction of these people, at least their extinction in Florida. So they just lumped everybody together. One of these Spanish Indians, to use a more general term, attacked an army camp, and Colonel Harney was sent fleeing. What was the story there? Harney went after Chiquica, who was the one who attacked Indian Key in a bold attack that ended up with the death of Henry Perrine, who was a noted national botanist trying to do experiments in new plants being introduced into South Florida. He was killed in that raid, I believe it was in 1840. 
Arnie was a pretty rugged guy, and I'm sure many of your listeners know about how rugged he was in terms of dealing with, with indigenous people. He was brutal at times, and one who was feared, and then he was in incredible physical condition. So there was a, a story about him having a foot race with an Indian in the Midwest in one of his early assignments. I, I don't remember what fort it was, but he got in a foot race and apparently he actually beat the Indian, which uh, really shocked shocked them <laughs> how incredibly physically fit he was. And then on the Coosahatchee River, where his troops were stationed, there was a raid early in the war on, on that trading post. And they were there in part to protect the trader. He personally was not sleeping or staying inside the trading post area where most of the soldiers were. He actually was sleeping outside. And the attack occurred, and he was not, not killed. But they did see him, and he literally ran from where he was, where that camp was, to the Pusatchu River, jumped in the river, swam, made his way all the way to the mouth, and eventually down to the Keys and around eventually to keep his cane. And from there, brought the war to the Indians by bringing in canoes, by dealing with what essentially would be like a guerrilla warfare, by prizing them with his own raids, with his really tough dragoons trying to get into the places where they were living and eventually confronted Chiquita. And Chiquita was hung by Harney after the raid. And I believe that's called the Hanging Island. That's off of Loop Road, that particular place. Harney was probably the first soldier to really make a dent on that guerrilla warfare tactic by bringing the war directly and deep into the Everglades. What are the challenges for an archaeologist working in South Florida? It's pretty difficult to go to any site in South Florida, and even if you find Seminole War-related artifacts or Seminole artifacts, it's very difficult to attribute that to any particular person. We looked at Harney's route. You know, you could only guess some of the different trails and ways he might have gone through South Florida. So we never found direct evidence of a particular place that Harney had been, other than the Seminole and Miccosukee uh, awarding for some of the islands, they called it the Hanging Island, which obviously is the place where uh, Chiquita uh, was hung. We know the identification of some of these places, but mostly through Indian lore as opposed to any archaeological evidence. I mean, most of what would be the archaeological heritage of South Florida has been destroyed in particular places, but surprisingly, a lot of it still remains and is preserved and in Miami's case, much of it was preserved below the buildings in downtown Miami because those early buildings in the early 20th century, right up to the 1950s, they didn't actually have to remove the soil. Uh, they weren't trying to uh, create deep foundations. They were basically putting in footers. So the soil and thus the sites were preserved. So that's how the Miami Circle was discovered because it was under an apartment complex built in 1948 under the building. And it was still there. That's not true today. The newer buildings are 70 stories high, that sort of thing. Everything is destroyed. So in this newest wave of development that began in the 1990s, more and more of the sites are actually being destroyed. But because of the law that Miami and Dade County have, we're able to document those sites before they're destroyed. In some cases, we've been able to preserve certain parts of them. It's been a very successful program for history. Seminole pulled some of their supplies from shipwrecks on the coast. What have you been able to find? Cut off from sources of supplies and material, cut off from essentially from things coming from Cuba and certainly from any, uh, you know, Americans who were in Florida. Uh, they did find that shipwrecks were a very important source of raw materials, and a lot of that included lead. I think one of the famous shipwrecks was Gil Blas that was shipwreck off Broward County coastline in the uh, Second Seminole War, and that ship was stripped of a lot of metals by the Seminoles, and they took those metals, copper and lead, and used a lot of it into making implements and making musket balls, for example. So that was an important source. I saw lead ingots were actually found on one site, not by me, but by a avocational archaeologist that likely came from a, one of those shipwrecks. So that was a critical part of their supply line, was the shipwreck. I know there's been a lot of shipwrecks looked at on the southeast Florida coast, and I suspect that some of these have been looked at by salvers and so forth, but 
the research you would need to do to know which ones are connected to that similar war activity would be more speculative unless you could identify the ship particularly and you knew for a fact. But I would just say that any ship that was shipwrecked in southeast Florida or the Keys during that time period was probably subject to some level of salvage by the Seminoles if it were accessible and if it was not within sight of the military sentry or our troops. What was the Spanish presence in the Miami area back in the colonial period? When the Spanish focused on settling Florida, their focus, as you know, was St. Augustine and Pensacola between East and West Florida. It's not that they weren't interested in South Florida. They were, and in the 16th century, they tried to create a mission and a fort there. It was not successful. That was by Pedro Menendez, who was the founder of St. Augustine in 1565. There was another attempt at creating a mission there in Miami in 1743, which also was unsuccessful. So there were attempts to create this type of presence. And eventually, the Spanish strategy was just to create an allied relationship with the tribes and the groups of South Florida as a bulwark against the English and the French and the expansionism, and maybe more importantly, being able to provide a safe haven for shipwrecked survivors. Because in the early 16th century, with the first Spanish arrival in South Florida, I'd say the life expectancy of a Spaniard on the shores of the Florida Keys would be about three to five minutes because they were quickly killed or taken captive and then eventually killed. So the Spanish were successful after a very hostile hundred years, or more, more or less, through trade and through attempts through uh, missionizing that really had more reliance on trading than on missionizing in terms of creating the alliances. They were able to actually get to the point by the 1700s where the Indians of South Florida were openly hostile against the English in particular, partly because of the, the slave rates uh, that the English had launched uh, and would kill the English shipwreck survivors, but would actually help the Spanish shipwreck survivors. So in that sense, that strategy changed things. But the Spanish made no real serious attempt to go down into Miami again and create any kind of major habitation or town. Likewise, surprisingly, on the New River in Fort Lauderdale, which is also a major riverway, that never occurred. Miami, again, became a focus of potential settlement when the British came to rule it in 1763 with the idea of creating a city on the north side of the river. With all things, uh, using a Swiss immigrants, that plan never was fulfilled. They had a similar plan for the Deering Estate area, which is color south of Miami. So there really wasn't any successful European presence in South Florida. And it was really after American acquisition of Florida that you began to see the, the success, if you want to say, the expansion of settlement in Southeast Florida. Although the Bahamians were very active and had some very interesting holdings in South Florida, both uh, on Biscayne Bay and on the New River, and actually had grants from the second Spanish period of uh, control of Florida, grants that gave them land. Well, interesting enough, you had these illegal English Bahamian tenants living in these various places from Southeast Florida in the very early 1800s and late 1700s before the American settlers arrived. There were settlers here in the 1840s, a lot through the Armed Occupation Act. The 1840s, through after the end of the Second Seminole War, you see a huge increase in settlers and people coming down. A lot of them probably related to veterans of the Seminole War who got to see South Florida and some of them liked what they saw. And the claims were made all along Lake Worth, of all the rivers. So there's documentation and archaeological documentation, not just archival, of these early settlers who were constructing mills and subsisting through fishing and so forth. And on the south side of the Miami River, there was a Dr. Fletcher. Eventually, these settlers got caught up in the Civil War. Most of them were Southern sympathizers. They were affected by Union raids that were going on in the Miami area. But it was really the 1840s, from that point onward, that you see the continual occupation of Anglo-Europeans and Americans in Southeast Florida. What American troops were down there during this period? With the 1849 Indian scare, the Seminole scare that thought was going to lead to war, a lot of troops came down. So every time there was a threat, there was a petition to the governor 
to uh, provide protection. And this is uh, often brought the U.S. Army back and the Navy, in some cases, back into South Florida. So these forts were important locations for protecting the settlers, the ones who stayed. Most of them during the war, they just fled from their settlements and went down to Key West, where they believed they were relatively safe, or to other parts, to, to North Florida. The forts were an important part of that protective system. There was even an attempt in 1849 during the Indian scare to protect a place on the headwaters of the Miami River. It was called by the soldier Fort Desolation, <laughs> one of his letters. We discovered that location during our uh, monitoring of construction. This is a fascinating site where they were manufacturing kunti, and this kunti operation had, I think, at least uh, about 20 Europeans and Americans working there, and they actually brought the army out and constructed a, a depot, and the soldiers finally called it Fort Desolation. We made an amazing discovery. We found, while they were doing the construction, the remnants of a trunk, like a clothing trunk, and that trunk was made of wood, but the wood was gone. And what was left were the metal fasteners. The fasteners and the emblems on the trunk were the U.S. Eagle, an American military-style eagle. And inside the trunk, we found this beautiful set of dishes and plates broken, all of them broken, all of them subject to fire, all of them burnt. We found military buttons from a coat. All of the buttons of the coat were inside this trunk all of them were subject to fire. And so somehow there was an officer, he must have been there with his wife because of this beautiful China, and including a set from Italy that the motif was a European fort at the center of the plate. Obviously, they lost everything in that trunk as a result of this fire, whether that was an Indian raid or by accident. It's you know just a matter of speculation, but that's certainly one of the most fascinating Seminole War discoveries that has ever been made in South Florida. Forts were destroyed through both natural fires and intentional fires, and you don't find much of the evidence of the fort. We looked at one fort, Westcott, I believe, and I think I was with Bill Steele on that, and it was in the Everglades National Park. And you could actually see where they had dug a trench with a embankment suggesting a defensive work on one side of the island. Uh, so that was interesting. But all that you'll find are artifacts. And we work with a metal detecting expert, and we've been able to locate a lot of these military sites. As many of your listeners know, the metal detection is a very important tool, can be a very important tool for documenting these sites. But we, you know, obviously we don't just collect the artifacts. We we make sure we locate every single artifact that's of significance, and we create maps, we create a record of this. So this is part of trying to make sure that we have a better understanding of what happened in the Seminole Wars and where. I mean, where is the big question, because uh, it's not so easy to go back and find some place that was abandoned in the early 19th or mid-19th century. And one of our great quests was, again, working with Bill Steele, was the discovery of the battlefield of the Battle of Okeechobee. That was a tremendously significant site to the state. And we, Bill and I realized in our studies that there was no physical evidence that anybody ever presented as to why they had put the marker, the Daughters of American Revolution marker, on US uh, 41, where they put it, because it didn't seem to be based on any knowledge, uh, physical evidence of the fort. And remember, Okeechobee was just wilderness. Uh, There weren't any settlers in Okeechobee until the very early, early 1900s, I think, Okeechobee might have become a town in 1911 or something. Again, I'm not sure of that. But there was this big gap of people not being there. So it's not like you had a local legacy of uh, oral traditions where you could go talk to some farmer or a rancher and and say, oh, yeah, you know, over here, uh, we know that's where it was. But it turned out it was the surveyors who lived in Okeechobee in the early 20th century who had this knowledge because they were doing surveys and uh, sometimes cutting trees and they were finding musket balls in the trees. And we were able to talk to some of the surveyors who had some of that knowledge. And eventually, uh, largely to Bill's effort in interviewing informants who thought they had artifacts from the battlefield, we, really there was only one out of the at least a dozen 
people we talked to that actually had an artifact associated with the battlefield, and that was one clue, and it wasn't even directly on the battlefield. It was a distance away. But eventually, after two years of searching, we were able to locate it and began to find the artifacts that were part of the military camp and part of the fort. And, uh, and we took that information to the state through their land acquisition program, their grants, and eventually, it took us 10 years, but we finally got the money to um, have that land acquired, and that battlefield is now uh, a park, and as many of your listeners know, uh, that's part of the, the reenactment is there every year. Bob, it can be difficult trying to excavate when you have competition from treasure hunters. What's the difference between what you do and what the treasure hunters do? The challenge for all of us, all of us, including the treasure hunters to some degree and collectors, we all have this penchant and curiosity uh, about history and what's there to be found. The difference, as you know, is that the treasure hunter often is just consumed with the idea of what something is worth. Some collectors, they're only interested in listing the things on eBay and and turning a profit. And I found some of them had to be very reliable, well-intended people who do create records. They do have documents. I don't mean records, just a note here and there, but it actually will create their own maps and create listings of things. Some of them don't sell anything. I mean, they, they just uh, put uh, these collections together with a lot of information that is uh, useful to the community. But the problem is that Generally speaking, the documentation is missing. And once you strip a site of it, the metal artifacts, the site might be hard to find because uh, most treasure hunters and collectors are not necessarily sharing these locations because they're essentially mining them. They're not interested in having competition. Creating an allied relationship is an important part of what I believe is something critical for our history. Why is a partnership a good idea? We need to have relationships with those people who are collectors and treasure hunters because they can make a difference. And when they understand that sometimes, in some cases, preserving these sites actually achieves exactly what they'd like to see. They'd like to see some of this wilderness and some of these sites preserved. And they always are lamenting how they got there before it was destroyed. I, mean, I had one guy telling me, ah, oh, gee, you know, they've destroyed the place. He's, he's calling me like uh, the day that they're bulldozing the site. Well, he'd been metal detecting there for two years, collecting everything he could. You know, if I had known two years earlier or a year earlier, I actually could have saved that site. And I think that kind of attitude has to evolve. There has to be this idea of creating a working relationship with the singular goals of preservation documentation. doesn't mean they can't participate, but for a lot of people, it's difficult. The idea of acquiring something and owning something it's very satisfying, and it's part of human nature. And as a kid, as a young guy growing up in South Florida, being a member of an archaeological society, I understand that. But we, as a group, quickly created the edict that we would have a common repository of all the artifacts that we were excavating. And that was a hard pill for many of these members to swallow. It was just contrary to their nature. But most of them did it. And that collection became a very important collection in the Historical Museum of Miami eventually at some point. And I think that attitude is important because when you can create that bond where you have that common mission and you can work out these things and there's a community benefit and there's a public benefit, that's good for all of us. If you're interested in history, well, then help us preserve it, not just by collecting the artifacts and putting it in a display case and then dying someday and your son or grandson gets it, doesn't even know where it came from. So you can tell I feel strongly about creating a relationship and making people aware of how important these things are in terms of understanding these site locations and documenting them fully. What are these treasure hunters looking for? We discovered it's a spectrum, and that is that there are collectors who are looking only for emblems and badges and military-related artifacts, things that are very recognizable and not so interested in glass shirts and ceramics and things like that. And then I've discovered there are others who really do collect everything and are actually interested in the whole assemblage on one level or another. You've got to be careful not to stereotype people into these simplistic groups because it is more complicated than that. And knowing that the assemblage is important. One of my great stories is a treasure hunter who came to the Archaeological Society. And he said to the president of the group, he said, you know, 
Uh, I just would like to get the uh, uh, six inches off the site, all the garbage and trash off the site that you're working. Uh, I'm doing his his accent because that's pretty accurate. And the president said, well, what are you talking about? He said, oh, yeah, I'm just going to get the metal stuff out of your way. He said, well, the metal stuff are the Seminole War artifacts and some Spanish artifacts. We, we're trying to document that. We don't see this as trash. The, the guy used the word trash. So creating a common mission, common understanding that what is important. I think this is all about uh, us as professional archaeologists reaching out and being accessible, being able to talk and uh, educate. But at the same time, you can't be arrogant about it. These treasure hunters and collectors know a lot more than archaeologists. There's some really, really smart people doing this and who are really, truly interested. But I think when you can create trust and a relationship based on this common mission and objectives, you can really make a difference in history in Florida. We talked about trade for the Seminoles. We didn't talk about Seminole attacks on lighthouses during the wars. How did successfully attacking lighthouses go hand in hand with their trade needs? Well, it's pretty simple. There were some white people living in there. Think about it as an economic strategy. If you could knock out some of the lighthouses, you had a higher likelihood of shipwrecks, which meant more potential supplies and materials for them. The lighthouses served the mission of trying to diminish or decrease the amount of shipwrecks because this was a way of ships knowing where they're at relative to reefs, starting with the Key Biscayne, Cape Florida Lighthouse. I believe that was built in the 1830s. Going down to Key West, there's another six lighthouses, and there was a light station off of Key Largo. So at least two of those, the light station off Key Largo and Cape Florida, were the focus of raid during the beginning of the Second Seminole War. And the light keeper off Key Largo, I want to say, can't quite remember his name, whether it was Watson, I'm not sure what his name was, but he was killed. He had gardens uh, on Key Largo. He was one of the victims. And then the Cape Florida Lighthouse was the focal point of the Seminole War attack, I believe, again, by the Spanish Indians. And uh, the, the light keeper, Thompson, was killed and the African-American servant or slave that he had, he was able to survive. But that was a tremendous, dramatic event where the light keepers took refuge in the light tower when the attack occurred. And the Spanish Indians set fire to the door and to the, uh, the wooden walkway and stairwell that went up into the lighthouse. And they had literally burned it away so the light keeper and his uh, assistant couldn't get away. And so the Spanish Indians just continued to take shots at these guys because they were out on the platform on the outside of Lighthouse Lens. After Hurricane Betsy, I believe in 1964, I was able to visit the lighthouse, and to my surprise, all the sand around the base of the lighthouse had been washed away. And there in the sand were musket balls, military buttons, and lens fragments from the glass that had been broken either during that attack in the Second Seminole War or a subsequent attack that occurred when the Confederates put the lights out during the Civil War. There were some engagements between the Army and Seminole or Spanish-speaking Indians in Southeast Florida. How significant were these? Well, I don't think any of the battles or skirmishes in South Florida in particular were significant in terms of the progress of the war. I think the success of the military in South Florida was simply their presence. Their presence in itself, by occupying the coast, by occupying parts of the Keys, put pressure on the Seminoles to maintain their refuge in the Everglades and in the Big Cypress. And so in that sense, it was a very successful strategy. So it wasn't one of uh, military victory, but rather a siege strategy. When the Seminole could trade after the wars and didn't need to get their goods just from shipwrecks, with whom did they trade? The Bahamas, Cuba? I'm so sure that there's a lot of documentation about trade with the Bahamas or Cuba after the war because, first of all, as you can imagine, the Gulf Stream is literally like a wall. It's almost like the wall there is trying to maintain in Texas with Mexico because that current is so strong that without without sail and skill, and it's very hard to make that crossing. I mean, it can be done. It has been done. But it isn't something you would do on an everyday basis. We look for archaeological evidence of connections with the Lucayan Indians of Bahamas, and we have actually done a lot of work in the Bahamas and look for evidence of the Florida Indian. In neither place have we found any substantial 
archaeological evidence of any connection. Now, we know that the so-called Black Seminoles migrated after uh, the acquisition of Florida by the Americans, the slaves, the escaped slaves, the so-called Black Seminoles. They knew it was time to leave, and many of them headed south to southeast Florida and ended up in the Bahamas, particularly on uh, Andros Island, where they created their own settlement to get out of Florida. So it had a huge effect on their resettlement. But they didn't cross by canoe. They were able to get rides on British ships, Bahamian ships that were there doing turtling or whatever, and they were able to put their canoes, in many cases, on the ships and their families and, and got dropped off, in, at least in this case, on, in Andros. And they were able to stay in Andros for several decades without being detected by the British government. So it's a, that in itself is a fascinating story. So where'd the name Miami come from? And don't say it came from the river. Miami sound, from what I can tell, it comes from Miami, which is a, an Indian word for sweet water. And indeed, the water of the Miami River at one time was sweet, it was fresh, it was very nice. Before the channelization of the creation of the canals linking Miami and Fort Lauderdale with the Lake Okeechobee, and in destroying the water quality, uh, essentially almost forever, back in 1909. Yeah, sweet water was Miami. A lot of Indian names got used and have been used in Southeast Florida, as you know. Back to digging. What if Fort Dallas remains? Well, Fort Dallas is invisible because it is completely built over in downtown Miami. And so the only evidence we have, aside from the archival documents, is the intensive archaeological excavations that we did prior to the development. And there we, we found buttons and uh, things you would expect to find. We found even, um, in some cases, intact bottles. A lot of artifacts from the 1830s, even more from the 1850s. We found a presidential campaign smoking pipe for President Millard Fillmore. That was one of the more interesting things we found. We found the, the direct physical evidence of an extensive military encampment. Fort Dallas was not a stockaded fort, and that tells you how secure they felt. They didn't even have to put a stockade up to protect themselves. They were spread over a pretty large area on the uh, north side of the river. There's a building that was uh, used as the officers' quarters. It wasn't built during the uh, as a result of the Seminole War. It was owned by an American settler. His last name was English. I think it was William English. And when the military came down in the Second Seminole War, they took over his residence, and including this uh, stone structure. That's the only structure left, and it was moved in 1921 to a park about a mile away from where it was originally. You can see that today. It was reconstructed. They took everything apart. They reconstructed the walls, the chimney. Essentially, it's the oldest structure in Miami. Fort Dallas was a significant presence in ensuring the security of that area for settlers and others. Yeah, I would say so. I would say the military played a major role in the Seminole Wars of securing that area, setting it up for settlers. The settlers weren't quick to return until after the end of the war. That's when things really started to change. And, and oh, just about every decent plot of land along any of the rivers were suddenly a focal point of settlement as part of this Armed Occupation Act. How important is archival information to what you do as an archaeologist? We've extensively used maps from the National Archives as good as they could be and different kinds of documents. We've built our knowledge from a combination of things, so the archaeology is just one part of it. But Digging Miami, as your readers will find, has some very extensive descriptions of where these sites are located and what's been found there over the years. It's like a missing chapter from Miami's history and understanding how much was here and the fact that so much of it actually survived in an archaeological context. Have the Seminole themselves been able to help your archaeological investigation in that area? I was fortunate some years ago I was the archaeological consultant to the Seminole tribe before they formed their own historic preservation office. Some of them were very interested in their history. Uh, they shared what they knew, but their knowledge was based on oral traditions and not necessarily on specific locations, although they were certainly aware of certain places without a doubt. They were very free and very interested in knowing about the Seminole Wars because they're very proud of the fact that they, you know, they're still there. What have you found in other areas, in Dade County, rather than just Miami proper? 
We did a systematic archaeological surveys. I mean, we found tens, dozens of sites, prehistoric sites, but many of them, these prehistoric sites tended to be the islands and the wetlands, so not surprisingly, the Seminoles would occupy the same exact location because of that elevation. Some of the islands were used for agriculture, for growing crops. Others were used for settlement. Some were used for uh, purposes of uh, graves. The Seminoles adapted very, very well to the big cypress and the Everglades based on uh, what, well, you know, what they had to do and made themselves at home there. Bob, what would you like to add as we close today? Did we cover everything you wanted to? I think we did cover it pretty well. I think it's, again, just a matter of continuing to realize that as much as we know, there's a lot we don't know. Historians and scholars in the future will probably shed even more light on this interesting part of our heritage. We'll have to leave it there. Bob Carr, thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars Authority. Thank you, Patrick. I enjoyed being here. This podcast is copyright 2023. The Seminole Wars Foundation, all rights reserved. Find us on the web at seminolewars.podbean.com or seminolewars.us. Front and back bumper music courtesy of the U.S. Navy Band.